Brian Koberger's attorney, Ann Taylor, had filed 13 motions opposing the death penalty. Now the state of Idaho has come back with 14 objections. Not only all these objections, but big news, the date has been changed. All these objections and a new trial date? I'm Lainey Law. And I'm attorney Andrew Myers. This has been a very busy week for the Koberger trial. We have all these objections. We have a new date. I can't even imagine what these people working in the courthouse are probably scrambling around trying to get all of this taken care of. A lot of shocking updates today. Well, it's a good thing that the courts have, for the most part, gone electronic because um, here's here's a list of all the ob uh, objections that the state of Idaho has filed. Uh, and uh, one little surprise at the end. But first, what we really need to do is take a look at the uh, new schedule that the new court in Idaho has uh, imposed on this case. So here it is. A new, they call it a redact. Of course, everything has to be redacted. Everything has to be private. Everything has to be a secret in Idaho. But um, here's the uh, order governing the further criminal proceedings and notice of the trial in the Brian Koberger case. Voir dire. That's a fancy schmancy word in uh, Latin for, or French actually, for jury selection. Voir dire means they're going to select a jury, and jury selection will start on July 30th of 2025. Which is crazy because, you know, that's when we were looking at having trial around then. It's like we're being pushed back so much. It's like now we're going to be figuring out the jury over there. So the jury then. trial itself has been set back to August 11th. Do you remember an uh, old judge, judge in Moscow, Idaho, had set the trial date for June 2nd? That's canceled. That's off the table. Uh, the judge in um, Boise, Idaho, pushed it back. Two months. Remember, uh, he had said, well, forget June. We're either going to do it in May or September. Well, he kind of sort of compromised, but he got closer to Ann Taylor's uh, suggestion of September. The trial will start on August 11th, 2025, and run through November 7th of 2025, <sighs> inclusive of the penalty phase if necessary. Trial will begin each day at 8.30 a.m. and conclude at approximately 3.30 p.m. with a lunch break of approximately 45 minutes, Monday through Friday. I hope there's some lunch places nearby. Because oh, my God. Well, even, like, just, like, do they have other breaks other than that? These are, I mean, it's not the longest day, but just a 45-minute break. Well, I hope that they have some lunch breaks places nearby. I don't know that courthouse. I know I, I've tried cases in one courthouse that, that have a fairly decent cafeteria inside of it, but most of them just have like a little stand and you got to walk someplace for lunch. So anyhow, the final pretrial conference will be held on May 15th of 2025 uh, and will be continuing until the next day, May 16th, if necessary. As to motions, and we're going to get into this in depth in a couple of minutes, the death penalty motions, uh, the state's responses to the defense motions challenging the death penalty were filed on the due date of October 10th, and the defense will have uh, until October 24th to file their, uh, their responses. And a hearing on those motions, same date that had been scheduled uh, in Moscow, uh, November 7th of 2024. The discovery uh, outline has been changed just a little bit. The last day to file motions to compel regarding any known unresolved issues is November 14th. I wonder if anybody would bet against Ann Taylor filing another motion to compel. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, at this point, how many motions are we deep? I don't even know. This is a bunch. <sighs> Overwhelming. So responses to the motions due December 6th, replies are due December 20th, Merry Christmas. A hearing on the discovery motions will be held January 23rd and continue the next day. Um, motions to suppress 
by November 14th. That's coming up pretty fast. My, I was just thinking, it's just like, I'm already stressed out about the holidays and it's not even November. This is, I can't imagine yeah. having this on your plate in the next two months. Yeah. And, you know, motions to suppress, you know, often those are filed closer to the date of the trial. But anyhow, then motions to eliminate, uh, which are motions, fancy word for motions to keep uh, certain evidence out. Uh, that would be by February 10th. Uh, the defendant's discovery deadline is January 9th. Then there are, you know, uh, deadlines for experts uh, and uh, trial materials, uh, proposed jury questionnaires. These are really more for the um, attorneys. They shall exchange all of their exhibits by April 21st. It'll be interesting to know if the public will be given uh, – access to these exhibits because there's going to be a lot in there where, where everything has been kept secret shielded gagged non-disseminated etc it would be interesting to know if we will be allowed to see those uh exhibits uh when they're exchanged in april you know spring comes there's more sunshine maybe there'll be more sunshine on this case there's no way we'd see them in April. We'd have to see them. Not in, You don't think we'd have to wait until September if we were going to see them? Nope. Right there it says copies of exhibits shall be exchanged by April 21st. The question is whether we get to see them, though. Uh, and so that is the uh, new um, schedule for the trial. Uh, and uh, it remains to be seen whether that'll be adhered to. I believe uh, this judge is pretty no-nonsense. Remember the very first hearing, he said, I wish I could say I was happy to be here, but let's not start with a mistruth. So he seems very dedicated. He wants to, you know, no nonsense. Let's Don't fool around with me. Get your stuff in. Here's We debated the schedule. We had a hearing. There was another hearing that was closed. Who knows what was said in there? But I think, I think barring some unforeseen circumstance, my educated guess, but that's all it is, is a guess, is that he'll want to conform to this. Mm -hmm. He will want to conform to this schedule. It's a very, uh, you know, I think it's a realist. I think it's a realistic schedule, which is nice to see, but it like makes my skin crawl to think it's like they're getting so much done within the next two months. And then even with the court date itself um, next year, it's like they're planning for two months, which I, you know, I think is appropriate, but also, oh, you know, I'm glad that we're as far away from it as possible. Obviously. Well, it's 10 months out. I mean, right now in um, October, you know, they have the rest of the fall, all winter, all spring, most of the summer, because when August starts, you start seeing the back to school stuff in the store. So they've got 10 months. And this judge uh, in one of the initial hearings, he says, well, if we have to work Saturdays and nights. We do it. So I think that's his attitude, I think. Mm -hmm. And I've been before judges that are very no nonsense and they're fair usually, uh, but they, you know, they're, they're going to be equally tough with both sides. So now uh, the real breaking news, if there's any such thing, and we're not a break. I know people email and say, did you hear what just happened? It's like, you know, yeah, I listen to the radio. <laughs> I get breaking news. Uh, but the, the value that we add is, you know, hopefully being able to analyze. So now there are 14 objections filed by the prosecution uh, objecting to the motions to strike the death penalty. And the way this works is that if Mr. Koberger is found guilty, of course, if he is found guilty, then a whole new phase begins in the trial to determine whether or not the DP will be imposed. And there are aggravating factors. And Mr. Koberger's attorneys filed 13 different motions to strike these various aggravating factors and the other things that go into that phase of the trial. So the state prosecutors said, okay, guess what? Here are 14 objections to those 13 Motion. So we're not going to go over every single word of every single one, but I think after we go through a couple of these, you'll get the gist of what the state is up to. So the first one I want to take a look at is um, the state's objection to the defendant's motion to strike. Can you see that? Okay. It's beautiful. I, okay. All right. State's objection to the defendant's motion to strike the state's notice pursuant to the Idaho law on grounds of 
arbitrariness. So comes now the state of Idaho by and through the Lataw County prosecuting attorney, because remember, this was filed back when they were in uh, Moscow, Idaho, and hereby objects to the defendant's motion to strike the state's notice pursuant to the Idaho Code on the grounds of arbitrariness. Citing a law review article, defendant asserts two challenges to Idaho's capital sentencing statutes. First, the defendant claims Idaho's capital sentencing statutes do not sufficiently narrow the class of convicted first-degree murderers who are First, defendant claims Idaho's capital sentencing statutes do not sufficiently narrow the class of convicted first-degree M's who are eligible for the DP. Second, defendant argues that Idaho's capital punishment scheme is unconstitutional because of alleged geographic disparities. The Idaho Supreme Court has rejected both arguments. Even if there were some legal basis for defendants' arguments, the law review article he cites does not reliably support his arguments. Idaho's capital sentencing scheme complies with the Eighth Amendment's narrowing requirement. Capital punishment may not be imposed under sentencing procedures that create a substantial risk that punishment will be inflicted in an arbitrary and capricious manner. To avoid arbitration application, a state's capital sentencing scheme must genuinely narrow the class of persons eligible for the death penalty. Most states, including Idaho, have chosen to narrow the class of persons eligible for the death penalty by requiring the jury to find the presence of at least one aggravating circumstance before imposing the death penalty. Each aggravating circumstance may not apply to every defendant convicted of murder. It must apply to only a subclass of defendants convicted of murder. And I have to add in here that um, we're reading only the um, substantive text of this motion but um, the state has cited, uh, in this case, Supreme Court law. So what they're saying is, you know, we're just not making it up here. Here, here is the substantive argument that we have. And we're citing, in this case, uh, three or four different United States Supreme Court cases. I'm glad they're starting to cite cases, though. That's great to see on the <laughs> prosecution's yeah. part. I feel like we were missing some citations for a bit. So this this goes into a great deal of depth, and we'd be here all afternoon. The stuff is all posted publicly, so you can uh, take a look at it. But they um, conclude by basically saying that the author of this um, law review article did not catalog all possible aggravating and mitigating circumstances, which means her death eligibility decisions failed to account for those cases where the mitigating evidence removed the perpetrator from death eligibility. Eligibility for the death penalty in Idaho does not depend exclusively on aggravating circumstances. Rather, if an aggravating circumstance is proven beyond a reasonable doubt, the defendant shall be sentenced to death unless mitigating circumstances which may be presented are found to be sufficiently compelling that the death penalty would be unjust. Uh, Because the author of the article did not conduct an empirical review of the mitigation evidence in each case, she could not have accurately concluded whether each defendant was, in fact, eligible for the death penalty under Idaho law. So did you follow all of that? You know, I did follow it, and I can't help but wonder. Like, I want to know what our viewers think about, like, the DP, because... It's so it it feels a little surreal to read this argument basically saying like, no, we're going to it's still going to be on the table. It's still going to be on the table when at the end of the day, I just think about how many people and I'm not saying one way or another for this case, but you consider how many people get wrongfully convicted. It's weird. Like, obviously, the whole point of the justice system is to come to the correct conclusion. But it's just like unsettling to me where it's just like you have people who are wrongfully convicted for 30 years years new evidence comes out that finds them innocent so to be fighting for death penalty like obviously this is a very serious situation that we have four victims and i understand like the eye for an eye mentality but well yeah there there have been a couple of cases in idaho and we've talked about them in previous episodes where people uh, were wrongfully convicted and there was also a case we did just a couple of weeks ago in the uh norfolk county where a gentleman had spent 35 years behind bars 
due to a wrongful conviction by the Norfolk County, Massachusetts, sound familiar, mm -hmm. uh, district attorney's office. The guy uh, got a multi-million dollar settlement against both the Commonwealth, which was restricted to only a million dollars, but the town of Braintree had to uh, end up paying him. I think it was $35 million. Thank God. So, yeah, wrong. you're right. Wrongful convictions do occur. I remember many years ago, I was a strong advocate of the death penalty. I've kind of softened on that, having seen everything that I've seen. Now, you ask, how does all, what are we talking about these um, aggravating circumstances? The way that it works, and let's take a look at the statute now, um, Title 19, Criminal Procedure, Chapter 25, where a person is convicted of an offense which may be punishable by death, a sentence of death shall not be imposed unless, well, there's got to be a notice of intent. They did that, although they're bickering over whether it was done correctly. <laughs> But once Mr. Koberger were to be convicted, if he's convicted, uh, then Section 3B, the jury or the court, if a jury is waived, finds beyond a reasonable doubt that at least one of these statutory aggravating circumstances uh, exists, where a statutory aggravating circumstance is found, the defendant shall be uh, sentenced to D unless mitigating circumstances which may be presented are found to be sufficiently compelling that the death penalty would be unjust. The jury shall not direct imposition of a sentence of death unless it unanimously finds at least one statutory aggravating circumstance. So that's why we're talking about these aggravating um, circumstances. All they have to do is find one statutory grounds and they're they're listed also in here and we're going through some of them right now if they find if, if mr koberger were to be found guilty then they go into the second phase of the whole thing and they consider all of these um aggravating factors uh ann taylor tried to knock them off one by one and now the state's saying no she was wrong so let's take a look at another one of these the next motion we're going to take a look at is the state's objection to expert testimony from Eliza Culver. You asked me before we started uh, this episode, what did she do wrong? Well, this is what they say she did wrong. Comes now the state of Idaho by and through the Lataw County prosecuting attorney and hereby objects to the proposed testimony of Eliza Culver in support of the defendant's motion to strike the state's notice pursuant to Idaho Code 18-4004A on grounds of arbitrariness. Professor Culver's testimony would not be helpful to this quote, court. It is now well established in Idaho that, quote, testimony containing conclusions of law by an expert witness is generally inadmissible. Now, that's kind of interesting because you ask, well, how come they had all these experts? They, you know, they had all these experts uh, on the um, motion to change venue. And now we're talking about the experts that are going to be brought in uh, with respect to the um, DP. An expert is allowed to provide an opinion uh, based on their education, training, and experience. And if the court finds that they have sufficient background in those three areas, then their opinions are allowed. Uh, lay witnesses who you know saw what happened purportedly or heard something, uh, they're only allowed to testify as to facts or alleged facts. You're not allowed to have an opinion in testimony unless you're an expert. What the state prosecution is saying here is this is neither a fact nor an opinion. This is a conclusion of law. And that's the court's job. It's not the um, expert's job. So as the Idaho Supreme Court has explained, when an expert witness offers a legal conclusion, it invades the province of the court to determine the applicable law. Defendant submitted as Professor Culver's expert a report a law review article titled Narrowing De-Eligibility in Idaho, an Empirical and Constitutional Analysis. As the title suggests, Professor Culver's article is a legal analysis of Idaho's capital sentencing scheme. The article sets out her view of the Supreme Court precedent on capital punishment and ultimately concludes that Idaho's high rate of death eligibility 
shows that the <laughs> capital scheme is failing to genuinely narrow the class of persons eligible for the death penalty. Is that and not a red flag? <laughs> Sorry. Well, yeah. I mean, what they're what they're saying is she is offering a legal analysis, not an opinion. And that's the court's job. <laughs> it, 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 it's too factual. That's <laughs> basically what it sounds like they're saying. They're like, she's only allowed to share her opinion. She's coming here and she's trying to share facts. That's how right. I'm interpreting that. Well, I think I think what they're saying is, you know, look, it's the it's the attorney's jobs. You know, the state argues, you know, how the law would apply to their case. The defense argues how the law applies to their case. And it's the judge's job. Uh, to um, tell the jury what the law is. Uh, and they're saying here, basically, um, Professor Culver is giving us a legal analysis. No, nah, -uh, that's for the judge. The final sentence here, such legal analysis and argument is adequately performed by defendant's counsel and admitting it through Professor Culver's testimony would invade the providence of the court to determine applicable law. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> it's just I I don't know because obviously it it just it feels uh, the, the DP is something very serious obviously but a lot of the times when I look at these stuff it almost feels like they're just trying to argue for the sake of arguing and maybe the prosecution really does believe that it's the just and right thing to have on the table but it is just unsettling to just be fighting to unalive someone so strongly. Well, probably a lot of people would agree with you. Um, moreover, Professor Culver does not have sufficient foundation. Now, this is really important in the law. To testify in a court of law as to the results of her empirical study, the proponent of expert testimony must lay a foundation for it. And that's, you know, law school evidence 101. This means that courts must review both the expert's qualifications and the records relied upon by the expert to determine whether the expert can establish the necessary foundation. As the state explained in its response, Professor Culver did not have access to sufficient information to determine whether each of the defendants mentioned in her article were legally eligible for the death penalty. Uh, neither Professor Culver nor defendant provided this court with sufficient information such that it could fulfill its obligation to review the records relied upon by the expert to determine whether the expert can establish the necessary foundation. Defendant has thus failed to lay a proper foundation for Professor Culver, and this should preclude her testimony. So, what they're basically saying is she she jumps to conclusions and says the death penalty isn't uh, shouldn't be taken seriously it doesn't apply in this case etc cetera, etc cetera. but she bases all of that on case studies cases she didn't even explain in the in the in her motion i mean in her uh article so mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a quiz uh oh I'm gonna put you on the spot uh oh do you notice anything like kind of interesting about these um, pleadings that have been filed. Um, well, we're zoomed in onto the signatures that look like uh, scribbles. So, yeah. <laughs> well, interestingly enough, remember a few episodes ago, I kind of predicted that uh, the uh, Moscow prosecutors that were very much familiar with William Thompson and uh, Eliza Masoth in. Ashley Hush Jennings, we're going to take more of a back seat. Well, look at this. Look who signed this. Jeff Nye, Special Assistant Attorney General, and Bill Thompson signed off as the second signatory. You say, oh, that's that's not significant. Well, I think it is because of the 14 objections uh, that were filed, um, seven of them were signed by Jeff Nye of the Attorney General's office. Seven of them were signed by Ingrid Beatty, uh, who is also with the Attorney General's office, and Bill Thompson signed as the second signatory. I think this is the beginning of kind of the phasing out of the Leta prosecutors and the phasing in of the Attorney General's office. It's not happening suddenly like, you know, you see a movie and they change scenes like that. No, it's, they're kind of fading 
they're fading out the uh, Leta people and fading in the attorney general. Now, maybe I'm making too much of that. Let me know down in the comments if I'm making too much of that. Well, I think it's a good observation that, uh, like you said, is just like if he, if, if he just was gone randomly all of a sudden, it would lead to a lot of speculation. But to have him kind of take a back seat is almost like an easier way to get someone else in the lead seat. Yeah. Now, did you ever hear a hack? Mm. Look at this next motion. So this is the next objection that we're going to look at. The state's objection to the defendant's motion to strike the hack aggravator. What is the hack aggravator, mm -hmm. you ask? Well, comes now the state of Idaho by and through the Lataw County prosecuting attorney and hereby objects to the defendant's motion to strike the HAC, heinous, atrocious, and cruel aggravator for the following reasons. Defendant's motion should be denied. It is well established that a capital sentencing scheme must genuinely narrow the class of persons eligible for the death penalty and must reasonably justify the imposition of a more severe sentence on the defendant compared to others found guilty of murder. In a companion motion filed contemporaneously with this one, the defendant correctly do, 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 acknowledges that the Idaho Supreme Court has held that Idaho's capital sentencing scheme meets the standard. As the Idaho Supreme Court explained in Wood, this court has upheld the constitutionality of its death penalty status on numerous occasions. Uh, and then citation, nevertheless, the defendant advances two arguments. First, he argues that the court should find that the gloss placed on the HAC aggravator by the Idaho Supreme Court was in violation of the Idaho Constitution. Second, he asserts that Idaho criminal jury instruction for the hack aggravator does not contain the necessary limiting construction set forth by the Idaho Supreme Court in State v. Osborne for the reasons set forth below. Both defendants' arguments fail. Uh oh. Are you beginning to see a little bit of, um, you know, similarity between the, the way these motions go, which is why we're not mm -hmm. going to do all 14 of them. We're going to look at four or five of them. Um, this court cannot overrule the Idaho Supreme Court. What they're saying is this is a trial court. The trial court is underneath the Supreme Court of Idaho. And of course, they have to follow precedent. A, a trial court, a district court can't set precedent. So as a threshold matter, this court cannot overrule the Idaho Supreme Court. The Idaho Supreme Court unambiguously set forth its authority in State versus Guzman. To this court falls the obligation to be and remain the ultimate authority in fashioning, declaring, amending, and discarding rules, principles, and doctrines of precedential law by application of which the lower courts will fashion their decision. This court has been and remains the final arbiter of Idaho rules of law, both those promulgated and those evolving decisionally. Wasn't there a TV show, Who's the Boss? Mm. I, I think they're saying, <laughs> we're the boss. Damn. Because defendants arguments that this court should hold unconstitutional, the Idaho Supreme Court's limiting construction set forth in State v. Olson, I'm sorry, State v. Osborne, requires this court to effectively overrule a higher court. The court should discard it outright. So if that's true, mm -hmm. if that's true, you know, it would seem that this would be uh, relatively, relatively easy. And what I found interesting here is they were kind of arguing, the um, defense was, that the jury instructions uh, were not consistent with the law. Well, the prosecution team is saying, nah, -uh. the ICJI for the HAC aggravator appropriately reflects the case law. Defendant argues that the Idaho criminal jury instruction, the instruction for the HAC aggravator, does away with the additional proofs set forth in the case law. Osborne, they just come right out and say here, that's wrong. A comparison can be found below. And I found this really interesting because what the state is saying is that um, Coburger's attorneys got it wrong. They're saying the jury instructions do not reflect the case law. Well, here's what the case law in State versus Osborne said in yellow. What's intended to be included are those capital crimes where the actual commission of the capital felony was accomplished by such additional facts as to set the crime apart from the norm of capital felonies. But the language of the jury instruction says the terms heinous, atrocious, or cruel are intended to refer to those first degree murders where the actual commission of the first degree was accomplished by such additional facts as to set the crime apart from the norm of first degree murders. They seem pretty similar. The norm. <laughs> so, yeah. It, it's pretty much the same, isn't mm -hmm. it? I agree with that. Yeah. That and they're so similar. The case law says heinous means extremely wicked or shockingly evil. Well, the jury instruction says a murder is heinous if it is extremely wicked or shockingly evil. I Wait mean, a minute. <laughs> it's just a rewrite. That's all. It's a rewrite. They changed the wording and therefore not valid. It's pretty much the same. Really. And then the next one, atrocious. Atrocious means outrageously wicked and vile. The jury instruction says atrocious means outrageously. That's a cut and paste. Word by word. It's a cut and paste, really. No, Cruel. too different. <laughs> Cruel. I, I haven't really seen these for quite a while. Cruel means designed to inflict a high degree of pain with utter indifference to or even enjoyment of the suffering of others. Well, it's pretty much a cut and paste. In the jury instruction. And that's how it should be. I mean, all courts, I mean, when I've tried cases, you know, the courts have standard jury instructions. Uh, the two states, 
that I practice law and have standard instru jury instruction and any attorney. Well, we used to buy the book and, and, and you'd, you know, every year you'd take pages out and put pages in. Thank God with the internet, we don't have to do yeah. that anymore. We could just go online and get the standard jury instructions. Now, every case has its own little uh, peculiarities. There's the little rabbit holes you go down in one case that you don't go down in the other case. So when you write a jury instruction, what you do is you look at a statute or a case and you pretty much parrot the language. And if you change it at all, you got to be very careful to pattern it into the facts of your case and you submit it to the court. The court then, with opposing counsel right next to you, fashions what its jury instructions are going to be. So the, it's always a fight. Jury mm -hmm. instructions, even though we have standard jury instructions, are always a fight. But that's what they're talking about here. And this is almost a cut and paste, too. I Oh, my God. I have so much sympathy for attorneys at this point because seeing that, where you're going to argue that it's too different when, like, you look at it and it's just those same words rewritten it's too yeah. high pressure it's uh, how do you argue like obviously the attorney's jobs are to just fight for their case all day but how do you fight that these and saying that these are uh completely different yeah actually it was attorney jay logston that had written the um motions to strike the death penalty and, and went through each aggravating factor so he's the one that said that these are signed off on the motion at least that said that these were different but I, I how is this different the the case law on the left in yellow it might be argued that every m involves depravity the use of the word exceptional however confines it only to those situations where depravity is apparent to such an extent as to obviously offend all standards of morality and intelligence. Okay, the jury instruction says it might be thought that every M involves depravity. So far, so good. However, exceptional depravity exists only where depravity is apparent to such an extent as to obviously offend all standards of morality and intelligence. Pretty much the same. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that a grammarian, and oh boy, I've, I've dealt with grammarians in the past. I'm sure a grammar expert would point out to us at great length in pages and hours of analysis <laughs> that there's a, there's a grammatical difference. But substantively, there's no difference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. This, uh, my, that just <laughs> melted my brain to argue that those are different, that I <laughs> my skin is curling at the thought of because well, I think it's like attorneys have you guys have so much stuff to deal with in the first place. Now we're arguing over that is ridiculous. Well, that's basically what the state is saying here. The state is basically saying this is ridiculous. <laughs> uh, we'll jump here to um, it's like the state is saying, "Are you insane? Look how vastly these <laughs> different these two things it's, are." It's, uh, like we used to say in law school, it's a <laughs> distinction without a difference. You know yeah. I mean? Uh, I mean, you say that um, you have a half a dozen eggs. I say I have six eggs. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Give me a break. It, it, it's blue. It's teal. Oh. Yeah, you know. oh. So they, the, 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 the prosecution here says see State versus Osborne and see the Idaho criminal jury instruction available. And they give the uh, website where the above um, blue and yellow passages that we just looked at are available. The language of the standard jury instruction is nearly identical to the language in State versus Osborne. I don't like to take sides, but I think they're right on this point. Defendants' argument that the Idaho Supreme Court has somehow changed the wording of the HAC aggrav aggravator within the body of the standard jury instructions is flatly wrong and should be disregarded entirely. Conclusion, defendants' constitutional claims are foreclosed by well-established case law, and his motion is legally meritless. It should be denied. Well, before we go Don't. any further, I just, I just want to point out that this is, with some hyperbole and my inflection, this is the state's position. The defense, uh, Brian Kohlberger's attorneys, who have uh, shown their ability to make excellent arguments in the past— they have one more chance to reply to all of this before October 24th. So they have just shy of two weeks to respond to this. So this this isn't the final word. I mean, come on, that is a little bit of hyperbole. That That's flatly wrong and should be disregarded entirely. So, you know, the, uh, the Koberger's attorneys will get the final word on this. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. It's just interesting to see 
like the amount of documents and the back and forth that's being involved with all of these things. And I'm curious to see how this new judge is going to handle all of this because, like we mentioned before, he doesn't seem like he's playing around. He seems to want to get to the bottom. And he feels, it seems like he's been very lenient towards the defense as well, moving the trial to um, August, I believe it was. Yeah. Um, August 11th is a new trial date. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So it's going to be interesting seeing the combination of these 14 motions going with this new judge who is not happy to be here. Um, it's hard to say. It's hard to even predict where this is going to go. It feels like it just took a sharp left turn. Yeah, it sure does. So I think we're going to take a look at one more of these. Why don't we take a look at one more? Cause I think you're getting a flavor of uh, what the um, state is saying here. Now, do you remember that Ann Taylor, remember we, kind of scratched our heads over this. Ann Taylor wanted to try for Kate, the um, DP uh, portion of the um, trial. Remember that? Well, not the trifurcation. Yeah, so what's a trifurcation? She wanted three phases. They're in green there. Culpability, eligibility, and punishment. So let's go back. Um, comes now the state of Idaho by and through the Latah County prosecuting attorney and hereby objects to defendant's motion to trifurcate proceedings and apply rules of evidence during the eligibility phase for the following reasons, the court should deny defendant's motion. In his motion, defendant disregards applicable statutory authority and binding appellate decisions and instead makes a public policy argument that his court should do two things. First, he asks this court to disregard the language of Idaho Code 192515, which sets forth a two-part jury processing in capital cases. Under the defendant's proposed scheme, the trial would not be composed of a culpability phase and a sentencing phase and set forth by the statute, but would instead be split into three proceedings, culpability, eligibility, and punishment. Uh, the yeah, so the statute, uh, the prosecution is saying the statute sets forth a procedure, Idaho court code, excuse me, Idaho Code Section 19-2515 sets forth the procedure for sentencing in capital cases and calls for a single sentencing proceeding. Throughout that section of law, the code refers to, quote, a special sentencing proceeding or, quote, the special sentencing proceeding, clearly delineating a single hearing for the jury to determine whether uh, capital punishment is appropriate. It is therefore unsurprising that in Idaho, capital cases have generally followed the two-part procedure outlined by statute. So you know how I always say the good stuff is always in the footnotes? Mm -hmm. Why do attorneys always hide the good stuff in the footnotes? Uh, they're pointing out here that similarly, all of the criminal jury instructions set forth by the Idaho Supreme Court contemplate a single sentencing proceeding in capital cases. If the defendant is convicted in the first degree, there will then be a separate sentencing phase of the trial. The defendant in this case has been convicted of the crime of first degree M. We will now have a sentencing phase of the trial regarding the offense. In determining the facts, you may consider only the evidence admitted, admitted during the trial and during the sentencing phase. The state has the burden of proving the existence of a statutory aggravating circumstance, and that burden remains on the state throughout the sentencing phase. So they go on and on and on, and, and they, they take a deep dive down the rabbit hole of the state's proceedings. But basically what they say is, no, there's no, there's no, um, although it might be a good idea, you know, we can all talk about different ideas and thoughts and ways to do things better. I mean, anybody can overlook your shoulder and say, I have a better idea. You know, people do that to me all the time. But in terms of the law, if the statute specifies a proceeding, that's how it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Because if you deviate from that, you're creating a uh, grounds for um appeal so the court is basically saying no nah, or not the court i should say that the prosecution is basically saying no you can't make stuff up this trifurcation that's a good idea but you know what nah <laughs> yeah it's hard because i un i understand it to an extent where it's like you have rules to play by so you got to follow those rules but you know like you can't blame the defense for trying their best um Okay, so then I guess that last one we'll take a look at. 
Uh, the last one we will take a look at is a um, motion by the state. The state's objection to the defendant's motion to strike multiple victims aggravated. The, comes now the state of Idaho by and through again the Latah County prosecuting attorney and hereby objects to the defendant's motion to strike the multiple victims aggravator. Uh, and again, again, uh, people... People don't read footnotes. I love footnotes. This is an interesting footnote. It says, defendant is referring to Idaho Code Section 19-2515-9B, which applies when, at the time the M was committed, the defendant also committed another M. Going forward, the state will refer to this as the multiple M aggravator, as it more closely reflects the statutory language. The defendant does not make a legal argument in his motion to strike the multiple murders aggravator. Instead, he attempts to craft the public policy agreement. Unfortunately for the defendant, there is no legal authority that supports his motion. Defendant claims M's cannot be aggregated in the manner that makes the act of malice a forethought M aggravated. He baldly asserts that there is no way in which two M's can be aggregated in a way that makes the act of M aggravated except to resort to one of the other aggravators. In support of his contention, he does not cite a single statute or appellate case, but rather an article from the New York University Review of Law and Social Change. The article does not even stand for the proposition that the defendant claims it does. The article does not argue that multiple M's is not an appropriate aggravator in capital case. Rather, the article analyzes a study on capital cases in Texas and the extent to which non-legal considerations play a role in prosecutor and jury decision making. The article is summarized as followed. And rather so, than going into the whole mm -hmm. thing, you know, the interesting thing here is if true, I don't know if you remember that very first hearing that uh, Judge Hippler held, he said that if you cite a law counsel and there is, uh, and that law or that case uh, doesn't necessarily stand for the proposition you say it does, we're going to have a problem. And he says, if you cite a case for one principle, but there's also another principle, I want you to cite that too. So if this is true, and you know, we've done some research here, if this is true, this is going to be a problem for uh, Mr. Koberger's attorneys. And the reason it's going to be a big problem is because what they are talking about here is that this article is specifically referring to multiple victims as one of the legally relevant factors to consider in capital cases and further states that DP sentences are fairly and equitably imposed when such factors consistently form the basis of decisions to impose the death penalty. If this article can be read to present any opinion at all on the multiple M aggravator, it is that it is a fair legitimate and appropriate consideration in a capital case. So <laughs> what the prosecution is saying is maybe they didn't read it or maybe they're ah! misquoting it. Or maybe, you know, I don't know. Again, mm -hmm. uh, Koberger's attorneys have the last say. They can come back and reply and we will cover their reply. I guarantee you. We're not taking sides in this. If true, though, this is pretty fatal because, you know, you don't you don't cite an article, you know, we all like to read. I, I read stuff all the time. You don't read stuff and then cite it for the opposite thing that it stands for. That's well, and they, but basically, for also from what I'm understanding, like you said, is like the opposite thing that it stands for. But they're basically saying everything that they said. This is just like they basically are just saying nonsense, which I feel like is a pretty big accusation. When, like you said, this judge is not going to be playing around with this. So it, I feel like that'd be something that'd be so easy to fact check for on their part, though. It would be very easy for a first year law student because that's what you learn in first year is how to do your research. And it's, you know, in the old days, we used these books here and it took time. You had to get up out of your chair and walk over to the shelf and find the book, which in a multi-story uh, uh, law library, you know, I shouldn't laugh. And people put down in the comments, why are you laughing? This is serious. OK, I'll be serious. Now it's a lot easier because a first year law student can just sit at the computer and find this stuff, you know, in a couple of clicks. So uh, the other reason that this is very, very, very of, of all the ones that we've looked at here in this episode, this is one of the more important ones, because, again, remember the Idaho uh, DP statute that says all the jury has to do is find one. Again, 
if Mr. Kohlberger is convicted and we go into the DP phase, all the jury has to do is find one unanimously and beyond a reasonable doubt. All they have to do is find one. And this particular factor, this particular uh, aggravating factor is saying, if there's more than one M, then this is an aggravating factor. Well, guess what? There's four. Yeah. There's four in this case. We have Kaylee Gonzalez, Madison Mogan. We have Zana Kernodal and Ethan Chapin. So there's four. So this would seem to be a, nothing's ever a slam dunk, but this would seem to be a no brainer. The final really important point in this motion, and again, this is a really important one, that if the, if the uh, defense really wanted to knock one out, this is the one that they would want to knock out. There is no reason to doubt that the jury will be instructed that they may not double count or double weigh the evidence. Idaho Criminal Jury Instruction 1723 addresses this issue. The state has alleged more than one statutory aggravating circumstance in this case. You must consider whether the state has proven the existence of more than one statutory aggravating circumstance beyond a reasonable doubt by relying on the same facts or independent facts. The same facts without more cannot be relied on to find more than one statutory aggravating circumstance beyond a reasonable doubt. Independent facts must exist for each statutory aggravating circumstance in order for you to find that the state has proven multiple statutory aggravating circumstances beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, again, going back to just the, the focus here, they only have to prove one aggravating uh, factor and that there were four, it would seem that this would be a, a fairly simple one for the prosecution to prove. I would think that even a, even a very young, inexperienced prosecutor could, could prove this one. But anyhow, mm -hmm. so that's, that's uh, what happened in a, a flurry of filings uh, in the Idaho 4 case. Just a lot of new stuff happening. Uh, there was a hearing with respect to whether Ann Taylor shall remain. There are people out there that are saying, no, she's gone. What they're basically doing is rearranging the financial uh, chairs on the deck of the Titanic state of Idaho, shifting from the county payment to the uh, uh, state payment for uh, defense attorneys. So that was what was happening in a closed hearing, and a lot of stuff was filed under seal. But this is the stuff that we have access to at this time. And uh, so it's a new day. It's a new day for this case. It's, I, can't, I can't even imagine the stuff that's under seal right now because it's, so much is already out. And looking like out what we took a look at today, it's pretty intense stuff. It's going to be interesting to see what the defense has to say in rebuttal to all of this, because it's pretty much the state going and saying not -uh, to like pretty much everything that they've done and saying it is just like you're, what you're stating here isn't even in this paper, basically. So there's some fighting words. Yeah. I just want to add, add one little thing before we go uh, and move along. And that is that, you know, a lot of people out there are really taking sides in this case. A lot of people out there are really, you know, punching it down and saying that they're sure that, you know, he's guilty or they're sure he's not guilty. And we've tried to play it down the middle and both sides give us really nasty comments, <laughs> which is OK. I used to be a TV reporter and I'm used to people saying, you guys. So, you know, I've heard people say, well, I have a law enforcement background, so. And they say, and there's a couple of people out there that say that oh, I, with my law enforcement background, I, that doesn't make you an expert. It really doesn't. I mean, look at the law enforcement in the Reed case. Look at law enforcement in some other cases. And I'm not saying because I'm an attorney, I'm an expert. I just have the analytical skills that I have from doing this for 30 years and trying cases. But I, I'm not saying I'm an expert. I'm saying that with, you know, <clears throat> rounds and rounds and rounds of discovery that's been sealed and with motions to compel that have not really been acted on, we don't know. We try to play it down the middle. We look at both sides. We we don't go down the rabbit hole of the tunnels and all the other stuff. Um, we go down the rabbit hole of looking at what is there, analyzing the law and the arguments. And yes, we will take a look at the, um, the um, defense's um, response to the stuff that we read today. Because 
in fairness, we read we read a lot of what was filed in the 13 original uh, motions to strike the aggravating factors. And today we looked at about five of the really significant um, motions to uh, object to that. I think you get a flavor of it. They're all pretty much the same. They're all pretty much saying those uh, motions by the defense weren't cited properly. And, you know, what we really have to look at is this. So I think we pretty fairly covered it. If Mm -hmm. If you think we haven't fairly covered it, let me know, as you always do. It's like every one of our videos, you'll have like half the comments saying, oh, you guys are crazy for some, like thinking Koberger is innocent. And then the other half the comments are going to be like, I can't believe you guys say he is guilty. It's I know. Like I the know. Same we get it video. from both sides. Because I don't know if he's guilty. I don't know if he's innocent. Nobody knows that except for a few people in the world. I've always said, and I'll keep saying, I think Dylan Mortensen and Bethany Funk uh, are the wild card in this case. We don't know what other, why, there, there's a secret informant. We know there's a secret informant. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff we do not know. So if anybody's out there who's not Dylan Mortensen, Bethany Funk, or the secret informant, and they tell you that they know, not, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't care who you are. <laughs> I don't know. I've been hearing uh, some whispers, some uh, big, big conspiracies down in the comments. So... Yeah. <laughs> and yes, I read your emails. Yes, I know. I know. Um, I know I do read them. But, you know, we, we have to verify stuff. I, I, before I went to law school, I was a reporter. And so, uh, you know, you got to verify stuff. You can't just report, you know, gee, somebody came down on a flying saucer and, and did it. We, you, you know, you got to verify it. <laughs> we haven't verified that one yet. <laughs> <laughs> So that's my closing thought. What's yours? Well, my closing thought is that I can't wait to see what everybody has to say down in the comments. Thank you guys for coming day after day. We appreciate you being here. As always, let us know what you want to see and let us know your opinions on this. If there's any other cases you want us to go over, any other type of content, we would love to hear it. Okay, have a good one. Whether you're in the grocery store, the gas station, or anywhere else, please remember to be kind to people. You don't know what they're going through. And the same goes for our comments section. We want you to comment, but be nice, be kind, be positive if you can. And thank you for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe. Have a good one.